Hello everyone. Nothing to worry about. You did not miss a live stream if you are watching this. Um, I have decided to resume reading the book off stream so we can try and finish it just a little bit faster. So we are going to get through chapter 12 and 13. Hopefully on it, well, these videos will only be on YouTube. Um, I'm going to try and if I'm going to try to finish the book, but we, these will all be in separate video files. And I want to try and get this book done so we can start our next book series. So let's res let's start let's get started. Chapter twelve concerns laundry and Lubbock eggs. Carmen woke up early the following day because Waif stuck her small cold nose in Carmen's ear, obviously thinking they needed to go to the royal mansion as usual. No, I don't need to go, Carmen said crossly. The king has to look after Princess Prince Ludovic today. Go away, Waif, or I may turn into Isola and poison you, or Matilda and do evil magic at you. Be just go! Waif pattered sadly away, but Carmen was awakened by then. But before long, she got up, soothing her crossness by promising herself that she would spend a fine, lazy day reading The Magician's Journey. Peter was up, too, and he had other ideas. We're going to do some of this laundry today, he said. Have you noticed there are ten bags of it in here now and ten more in wizard norland's bedroom i think there may be ten in the pantry as well carmen glowered at the laundry bags she could not deny that they filled up the kitchen let's not bother she said it must be those kobolds doing it no it isn't peter said my mother says that laundry breeds if you don't wash it. We have a washerwoman, Carmen said. I don't know how to wash things. I'll show you how, Peter said. Stop hiding behind your ignorance. Angrily wondering how it was that Peter always managed to set her to work, Carmen shortly found herself pumping hard at the pump in the yard filling buckets with water for Peter to carry to the wash house and empty into the great copper boiler. After about the tenth bucketful, Peter came back saying, we need to light the fire under the copper now, but I can't find any fuel. Where do you think he keeps it? Carmen wiped her, wiped her sweaty hair back from her face and with an exhausted hand. It must work like the kitchen fire, she said. I'll go and see. She led the way to the shed, thinking, and if this doesn't work, we can stop trying. Good. We need just one thing that will burn, she told Peter. He looked blankly around inside the shed. There was nothing but a stack of wooden tubs and a box of soap flakes. Carmen eyed the place at the bottom of the boiler. It was black with old, with old fires. She eyed the tubs too big. She eyed the soap flakes and decided not to risk another storm of bubbles. She went outside and plucked a twig from the unhealthy tree. Shoving this into the blackened fireplace, she slapped the side of the boiler and said, Fire! And had to leap quickly backward as flames thundered into being underneath. There, she said to Peter. Good, he said. Back to the pump. We need the copper full now. Why, said Carmen. Because there's 30 sacks of washing, of course, Peter said. We'll need to run hot water into some of these, t in some of these tubs to soak the silks and do the woolens and then we'll need water for rinsing buckets and buckets more i don't believe this carmen muttered to wave who 
was pottering around about watching. Who was pottering about washing. She sighed and went back to pumping. Meanwhile, Peter fetched out a kitchen chair and put in put it in the shed. Then, to Carmen's indignation, she set out the tubs in a row and began pouring buckets full of her hard work for cold water into them. I thought those were for the copper, she protested. Peter climbed on the chair and began hurling handfuls of snowflake, soap flakes into the top of the boiler. It was now steaming and making simmering noises. Stop arguing and keep pumping, he said. It's nearly hot enough for the whites now. Four more buckets should do it. And then you can start putting shirts and things in. He climbed off the chair and went into the house. When he came back, he was lugging two of the laundry bags, which he left propped against the shed while he went back for more. Carmen pumped and panted and glowered and climbed onto the chair to pour her so for four buckets of water into the soapy clap of steam rising from the from the copper then glad to be doing something else she untied the strings that held the first laundry bag closed there were socks inside and a red wizardly rope two pairs of trousers and shirts and underclothes below that all smelling of mildew from peter's bathroom flood Oddly enough, when Carmen untied the second bag, there were the same identical things inside. Wizard's washing was bound to be peculiar, Carmen said. She took armfuls of the washing, climbed on the chair, and heaved the clothes into the copper. No, no, no! Stop! Peter shouted just as Carmen had emptied the second bag full. He came rushing across the grass towing eight more bags all tied together but you said to do it carmen protested not before we've sorted it out you fool he said you only boil the white things i didn't know carmen said sullenly she spent the rest of the morning sorting laundry into heaps on the grass while peter hurled shirts to shirts in to boil and ran off soapy water into tubs to soak robes and socks and 20 pairs of wizardly trousers in at length he said i think the shirts have boiled enough and pulled forward a swirling tub of cold water you put that fire out while i run the hot water off Carmen had not the least idea how you put a magical fire out. Experimentally, she slapped the side of the copper. It burned her hand. She said, Ow, fire, go out! And they sort of scream. And the fire obediently flickered down and disappeared. She su sucked on her fingers and watched Peter open the tap at the bottom of the copper and send steaming pink suds gushing away down the drain. Carmen peered through the steam as the tap ran. I didn't know the soap was pink, she said. It wasn't, Peter said. Oh my heavens, look what you've done now! He leaped out of the chair and began heaving out steaming shirts with the fork stick meant for the purpose. Every one of them has it splashed into the cold water turned out to be a bright cheerily pink. After the shirts, he forked out 15 teeny shrunken socks, all of which would have been too small for Morgan, and a baby-sized pair of wizardly trousers. Finally, he fished up a very small red robe and held it out, accusingly dripping and steaming for Carmen to see. 
That's what you did, he said. You never put red wool in the white shirts. The dye runs, and it's turned out almost too small for a kobold. You are an utter fool. How was I to know, Carmen demanded passionately. I've lived a sheltered life. My mother never lets me go near our wash house. Because it's not respectable, I know, Peter said disgustingly. I suppose you think I should be sorry for you. Well, I'm not. I'm not going to trust you anywhere near the mangle. The Lord knows what you do with that. I'm going to try a bleaching spell while I do the mangling. You go and get the clothesline and the tub of clothes pegs from the pantry and hang everything up to dry. Can I trust you not to hang yourself or something while you do that? I'm not a fool, Carmen said haughtily. An hour or so later, when Peter and Carmen both were, were weary and damp with steam, where soberly chewing yesterday's leftover pastries in the kitchen carmen could not help thinking that her efforts with the clothesline were rather more successful than peter's with the mangle and the bleaching spell the clothesline zigzagged 10 times back and forth across the yard but it stayed up the shirts now flapping from the pegs on it were, were not white. Some were streaked with red. Some had curious pink. Cur curlices? I don't know. All over them. And some others were a delicate blue. Most of the robes and white stri had white stripes on them somewhere. The socks and the trousers were all creamy white. Carmen thought it very tactful of her that she did not point out to Peter that the elf, who was ducking and dodging among the zigzags of the washing, was staring at it in grave amazement. There's an elf out there, Peter exclaimed with his mouthful. Carmen swallowed the rest of her pastry and opened the back door to see what the elf wanted. The elf bent his tall, fair head under the doorway and stalked into the middle of the kitchen where he put the glass box he was carrying down on the table. Inside the box were three roundish white things about the size of a tennis ball. Peter and Carmen stared at them and then the elf who simply stood there without speaking. What are these? Peter said at length. The elf bowed very slightly. These, he said, are three Lubbock eggs that we have removed from the wizard William Nordland. It was a very difficult operation, but we have performed it successfully. Lubbock eggs, Peter and Carmen exclaimed, almost together. Carmen felt her face draining white and very much wished she had not eaten the pastry. All Peter's freckles showed up brown on his white face. Waif, who had been begging for lunch under the table, set up a frantic whining. Why, why have you brought the eggs here? Carmen managed to say. The elf said calmly, because we have found it impossible to destroy them. They defeat all our magical efforts, magical and physical. We have finally concluded that only a fire demon is capable of destroying them. Wizard Nordland informs us that Miss, um, Car Miss Carmen will, by now, have contact with a fire demon. Wizard Nordland's alive? He's talking to you? P Peter said eagerly. Indeed, said the elf. He is recovering well and should be ready to return here in three or four days at the most. Oh, I'm so glad, Carmen said. So it was the Lubbock's eggs making him ill? 
That is so, the elf agreed. It seems that the wizard encountered a Lubbock some months ago while walking in the mountain meadow. The fact that he is a wizard had caused the eggs to absorb his magic and become nearly impossible to destroy. You are warned not to touch the eggs or attempt to open this box that they are in. They are extremely dangerous. You are advised to obtain the services of the fire demon as soon as possible. While Peter and Carmen gulped and stared at those three white eggs in their box, the elf grave the elf gave another small bow and stalked away through the inner door. Peter pulled himself together and ran after him, shouting to know more, but he arrived in the living room to see the front door slamming shut. When he followed when he, followed by Carmen, followed by Wave, rushed into the front garden, there was no sign of the elf at all. Carmen caught sight of Rollo peering slyly round the stakes of the st stalks of hydrangea, but the elf was gone completely. She picked up Wave and planted her in Peter's arms. Peter, she said, keep Wave here. And I'll go get Calcifer at once. And she set off at running down the garden path. Pee quick, Peter shouted after her. Pee very quick. Carmen did not need Peter to tell her that she, tell her that. She ran followed by waves dis, despairing and squealy howls. and ran and went on running until she had rounded the great cliff and could see the town ahead. She had to drop to a hasty walk and clutch at the stitch in her side, but she kept on as fast as she could. The thought of those round white eggs sitting on the kitchen table was enough to make her break into a trot as soon as her breath came back. Suppose the eggs hatched before she had found Calcifer. Suppose Peter did something stupid like trying to put a spell on them. Suppose she tried to take her mind off of all the awful possibilities by panting to herself. I am so stupid. I could have asked the, that elf what the elf girl was. But I clean forgot I should have remembered. I am stupid. But her heart was not really in it. She could see in her mind that Peter mumbling spells over the glass box. It would be just like him to try. It came on to pour with rain as she entered the town. Carmen was pleased. That should take Peter's mind off the Lubbock eggs. He would have to rush outside and bring the washing in before it got soaked again. Just so long as he hadn't done something stupid before that. She arrived at the royal mansion, soaked through and almost out of breath entirely, where she clattered at the knocker and rang the bell and ever more frantically than she ever had when Twinkle was on the roof. It seemed an age before Sim opened the door. Oh, Sim, she gasped. I need to see Kelsfar at once. Can you tell me where he is? Certainly, miss, Sim replied, not in the least put out by Carmen's soaking hair and dripping clothes. Sir Kelsifer is pre presently in the Grand Lounge. Allow me to show you the way. He shut the door and shuffled off, and Carmen dripped her way after him. Down the long, damp hallway, past the stone staircase, to the grand doorway, somewhere near the back of the mansion, where Carmen had never been before. In here, miss, he said, throwing the grand but shabby door open. Carmen went into a roar of voices and a crowd of finely dressed people who all seemed to be shouting at one another. While they walked about eating cake of elegant little little plates off elegant little plates 
The cake was the first thing she recognized. It stood grandly on a special table in the middle of the room. Although only half of it was there by now, it was definitely the same cake that her father's cooks had been working on yesterday evening. It was like seeing an old friend among all these finely dressed strangers. The nearest man, who was dressed in midnight blue velvet and dark blue brocade, churned and stared haughtily at Carmen, and then exchanged disgusted looks with the lady beside him. This lady was wearing not exactly a ball dress, not at tea time. Carmen thought silks and satins so sumptuous that she would have made Aunt Sempornia look shabby. Had Aunt Sempornia been there? Aunt Sempornia was not there, but the Lord Mayor was, and so was his lady, and so were all the most important people in town. Sim, asked the man in Midnight Blue, just who is this wet little commoner? Lady Carvin, Sim replied is the new assistant to his majesty, your highness. He turned to Carmen, allowing, allow me to present you to his highness, Crown Prince Ludovic, my lady. He stepped backward and shut himself outside the room. Carmen felt that the floor would be doing her a favor if it opened up in, under her soaking wet feet and dropped her into the cellars. She had clean forgotten the visit of the crown prince Ludovic. Princess Hilda had obviously invited all the best people of High Nordland to meet the prince, and she ordinarily, um, ordinary Car Carmen Baker had gate crashed the tea party. Pleased to meet you, your highness, she tried to say. It came out as a frightened whisper. Prince Ludovic probably did not hear. He laughed and said, Is Lady Carmen some kind of nickname? The king calls you, little girl? He pointed with his cake fork at the lady in not quite evening dress. I call my assistant Lady Moneybags. She cost me a fortune, you see. That's wonderful, dude. Carmen opened her mouth to explain what her name really was, but the lady in not quite evening dress got to her first. You'd no call to say that, she said angrily. You spiteful thing, you. Prince Ludovic laughed and turned away to talk to the colorless gentleman who was approaching in a colorless gray silk outfit. Carmen was... Carmen would have tiptoed away at once to find Calcifer, except that as soon as the prince turned, the light from the big chandelier overhead caught him in the side face. The eye she could see glowered deep purple. Carmen stood like a cold statue of horror. Prince Ludovic was a Lubbockan. For a moment, she could not move, knowing she was showing her horror, knowing that people would see how horrified she was and wonder why. The colorless gentleman was, was already looking at her with curiosity in his mild mauve eyes. Oh, heavens! He was a Lubbockan, too! That was what had worried her before when she met him near the kitchen. Fortunately, the Lord Mayor moved away from beside the cake table just then and bow, to bow deeply to the king and gave Carmen a glimpse of a rocking horse. No, there were many rocking horses, Carmen saw. It quite distracted her from the horror. For some reason, rocking horses were lined up all around the walls of the grand room. Twinkle was sitting on the nearest one. 
to the large marble fireplace, staring at her earnestly. Carmen could tell he knew she had had a shock of some kind and wanted her to tell him what had caused it. She began edging her way across to the fireplace. This gave her a sight, the sight of Morgan sitting by the marble fender playing with a box of bricks. Sophie was standing over him in spite of Sophie's peacock blue dress and her air of being part of the tea party. Carmen had a moment when she saw Sophie as a very large lioness with its teeth bared standing guard on on its small lion cub. Oh, hello, Carmen, Princess Hilda said, more or less in Carmen's ear. Would you like some cake since you're here? Carmen shot a regretful look at the cake and inhaled its luscious smell instead. No, thank you, ma'am, she said. I only came with a message for her, Miss this pen dragon, you see. Where was Calcifer? Well, there she is, just over there, Princess Hilda said, pointing. I must say that the children are behaving beautifully at the moment. Long may it last. She swished away to offer another finely dressed person some cake. For all its swishing, her dress was nothing like as fine as the others in the room. It was faded, almost white, in places and reminded Carmen rather of the laundry after Peter had worked his bleaching spell. Oh, please don't let Peter try any spells on those lobic eggs. Carmen prayed as she walked over to Sophie. Hello, Sophie said. Smiling rather teasingly beyond her, Twinkle was rocking on the rocking horse, going creak, 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 quite irritatingly. The fat nursemaid was standing beside him, going, Master P Twinkle, pray don't get down from there. Do get down from there. You're making such a noise, Master Twinkle. Master Twinkle, I don't want to have to tell you twice over and over this was probably even more irritating sophie knelt down and passed morgan a red brick morgan held the brick out toward carmen bull bick he told her carmen knelt down too no it isn't blue she said try again Sophie murmured out of the side of her mouth, Glad to see you again. I don't care for this prince at all, do you? Nor for the overdressed floozies with him. Erple. Morgan. Morgan guessed, holding the brick out again. I don't blame you, Carmen whispered to Sophie. No, it's not purple, it's red. But the prince is purple, or his eyes are. He's a lubbockin. A what? Sophie said, puzzled. Dead? Asked Morgan, looking at his brick disbelievingly. Great, 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 went the rocking horse. Yes, red, said Carmen. I can't, ex I can't explain here. Tell me where Calcifer is. I'll explain to him and he can tell you I need Calcifer urgently. Here I am, Calcifer said. What do you need from me? Carmen looked round. Calcifer was roosting among the flaming logs in the fireplace, mingling his blue flames with the orange ones from the logs and looking so peaceful that Carmen had quite failed to notice him until he spoke. Oh, thank goodness, she said. Can you come with me at once to Wizard Norland's house? We've got an emergency there that only a fire demon can do with police. And that is the end of chapter 12. Thank you so much, everyone, for listening. And I hope that you will enjoy the next chapter, which will also be just like this. I'm going to be only posting it on YouTube. So I will see you guys then. Thank you so much.